This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way. Shout in the same way. I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Shout friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves or servants because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. Shout amen. Amen. Please be seated. God, we thank you and we ask, invite, even plead with you. Pour out your spirit even the more. Work a miracle and take broken flesh such as I and fill me with your spirit and bring forth a word that will penetrate our minds and our hearts and our souls. Not just the listeners, but the one teaching and preaching today. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody shout amen. 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 Here, repeat this subject with me, if you will, please. Um, how, to build how to build friendships. friendships. That will change my life. life. All right. How to build friendships that will change my life. For those of you who are just joining us, let me give you a quick context for the passage that we have just read. Jesus is speaking. And this conversation between him and his disciples, who will ultimately become the leaders of the early church, takes place uh, just a few hours before Jesus is to be arrested. And he's really hustling and doing the best he can to summarize uh, the most important parts of his teaching since he started with them over the last three and a half years. Three and a half years of summary here really starts around chapter 13 and works its way through to about chapter 17. So here we have him sharing a couple of things that are important. Here's the first thing that he shares. At least I find it insightful. He says that the greatest expression of love is not the gift of a house or a ring or a car, but the greatest expression of love is one who's willing to lay down his or her life for another. And then he connects the greatest expression of love with this word called friends. Everybody say friends. I find that interesting. The greatest expression of love, Jesus connects it with friends. And then he seeks to describe the remarkable relationship that he's going to initiate with all who will put their faith in him across the ages through his crucifixion, death, and resurrection by using the same word, friends. Now, a graphic illustration of this is really Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 4, where the prophetic uh, pronouncement of what Jesus was going to go through happens hundreds of years earlier. And, and, and if you could, if you will, picture Jesus uh, a few hours after this conversation, literally under the weight of a horrendous cross having been beaten almost to death and he's struggling with the cross and you can hear the prophet Isaiah as he says yet it was our weaknesses that he carried it was our sorrows that weighed him down we thought that his troubles were the punishment of God, the punishment of God for his sins. Everybody shout, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed on the cross for our sins. He was beaten that we might be made whole, whipped that we might be healed. And Jesus would say, you see that picture that Isaiah is painting about me carrying your sorrows and your weakness and being beaten that you might be made whole? That's friendship. That's what he's saying. That's his definition. And at that moment, you see in this teaching, I think he takes this notion of friendship and he just he, he makes it a countercultural paradigm. Listen, here's another insight that comes. 
I am struck by how his mention of friends three times in these three verses doesn't have an adjective attached. See, if I was writing this or thinking about it in terms of myself, I would say, <laughs> no greater love than this, than one who will lay down his or her life for his best friend. So you don't just lay down your life for anybody. Come on here. I, I, I'm looking for an adjective, right? For his close friend. For her dear friend. I mean, you're talking about laying down your life. Let's say for one's long-lasting friend. I, I need an adjective, y'all. No adjective. Jesus says, no, friends. And then the other interesting thing about the notion is most of us think that you, all you can do is just have one or two really good friends, but, but you know, friends worthy of laying down your life for. Uh, but, but, but Jesus says, notice each time he says the word, it's plural. Friends. Everybody say friends. friends. I find this fascinating. Don't you find it fascinating? Here's something else that I find fascinating. And, and the church, we, we haven't, as a church, always lived up to this. We're, we're doing our best to live up to it here. But this is a fascinating point. Listen, Jesus teaches in this phrase, love one another as or in the same way I have loved you. Here's his point. <clears throat> He's talking to the folk who will, be give, who will give birth to the church. He says, he says, the way that I've been a friend to you, I want you to be friends to one another in this thing called the church. That's his suggestion. Everybody shout friends. 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 I, I, I want you to be friends to one another. Uh, the way I laid out my life for you, I want you to practice this in this radical thing called the church so here's the point the church community should be full of Jesus like friends folk who understand and practice friendship the way now the scriptures are clear about this New Testament has 51 another phrases and and here's an example Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 uh, where the writer Paul says bear each other's burden and you can see this notion of Jesus uh, carrying his cross and he's saying to us bear each other's burden so as to obey the law of Christ the teaching that Jesus gives us in John 15 our first John 3 16 says we know what love looks like Jesus laid down his life for us so we ought to lay down our lives watch it it's church language here for our brothers and sisters oh here is the logic that Jesus is implementing. Listen to this. He's about trying to change the world. Here's the goal. Romans 5:11, I'm paraphrasing. It says this. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, those of us who put our faith in him, we are no longer enemies of God. We are now friends of God. So he's taking enemies and making them friends with God. And then he says, we come together in the church and he's saying, now I want you to practice this notion of laying down your life one for another. And what's going to happen is I'm going to take folk who were formerly enemies outside of Christ, outside of the church, and I'll bring you together. This is a radical statement here. And, and, and I'm going to bind you together in the community as you learn how to lay down your life one for another. Let's make it practical. See, Jesus suggests that in the church, in Christ, Republicans ought to lay down their lives for Democrats. And Democrats ought to lay down their lives for Republicans. And the black ought to lay down their life for the white. And the white for the black. And rich folk ought to lay down their lives for poor. And poor folk ought to lay down their lives for the rich. And, 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 and inner city for the urban and vice versa. Whatever your opposite is, opposite is, God is saying, he or she is an enemy out there, but in here, we are friends. Yeah. Somebody shout radical. Yeah. 
It's radical, it's radical, it's radical. If you want to be a part of something radical, join the church. Join the church. I know we haven't always practiced it, but this is the big deal here. That we push relationships first, rules second. We push get to know folk. We push learn stories beyond divisions. Friends. It's fascinating, isn't it? All right. So here's the last thing is we, we pivot into the points now. So most of, many of us, we come here and we think, sounds good. I have enough trouble with the two or three friends I got. <laughs> well, that's a high standard. You see, some of us, we fall in one or two categories, right? Either because of personality and shape and life, we just feel like no one wants to be our friend. Or we have folk that we call friends, but we really feel like they are abusing us and taking advantage of us, and we really wish they were not our friends. <laughs> <laughs> or we've been so wounded and broken by previous relationships, we just try to avoid opening ourselves up to anybody for friends. So, I want to tell you how to build Jesus-like friendships that will literally change your life. Are you ready? ready. All right, all right, here it goes. Wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> Be it. Be the friend. Be the friend that you wish you always had and you never could find. Be the friend. You're in high school and be the friend that, that, that no one will dare be to you. You be that friend to somebody else. I promise you it'll change your life. Be the friend. That's what Jesus does. He comes and he is the friend. And then he says, I've loved you in this way. Now I want you to practice what I have been for you. You be it for others. Be the <laughs> friend. Come on, tell somebody, be the friend. Not just any friend, but a Jesus-like friend. All right, so, so what, what is a Jesus-like friend? I love how y'all ask questions. <laughs> All right, All right. Just, 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 just drawing from this text. First of all, a Jesus-like friend knows how to put others first ask the person next to you do you put others first ask them what did they say what did they say <laughs> all right <laughs> This notion of laying down one's life for a friend has the notion of being able to put other folk first. It's particularly if you're in the church that, that you put other folk first. Listen, if President Barack Obama came in here and, and, you, you, and he came close to where you couldn't find a seat that's crowded in here like this, you'd be happy to give up your seat even if you were not of his political party and if you didn't particularly like him just because of deference for the office and for the person you do, because you bestow that on on him. Well, here's the point. Here's what Jesus teaches. Right? How would your life be different if you went through the world, went through life, if, if on your job you treated everybody like they were President Obama? How would your life be different if you treated your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend like they were President Obama? How would your life be radically different if you honored folk ahead of yourself? Yeah, I know it's not, in some ways, the American culture. It's every man, every woman for themselves. But I'm talking about a Jesus-like friend. Philippians, Paul lays this out. 
there's a congregation like ours and they're kind of going they're below the bar here. So Paul says, listen, men and women, if, if there's anything serious about your faith, do these things. In, in verse 2, he, here's what he says. So number one, he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress other people. He says, be humble and think of others better than yourselves. In other words, prefer others. Give others the preference. That's what he's saying. And he says, uh, uh, and he says, don't look only to your own interests, but take interest. Say, take interest. Take interest in others too. All right? Don't be selfish, self-focused, self-centered. There's two ways in which to be self-centered and self-focused, and neither of these types make good friends. One is arrogant. Everybody say arrogant. That's when you're the center of the world. You've got to be the center. If you're, if, if you're, on the, if, if you're in the game, you've got to run it. Come on, um, if, you, if, you make the, if you make a point, it always has to be right. If you're in a setting, you always have to be the teacher. You're the leader. You're the one. You're the one. Everybody, all eyes on me all times. Doesn't make for a good friend. <laughs> Certainly not a Jesus-like friend. You're never wrong. Never wrong. I was counseling a couple one time, and I had them sitting in front of me. And the wife had just laid out about a two-mile list of all the wrongs her husband did. It was big. And so I asked her, I said, in the last, you know, few days, have you done anything wrong? Just one thing? And she thought, and she thought, and she thought. <laughs> it's a true story. She said, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I said, what about when you cursed him out yesterday? Was that wrong? Because they had told me about this. She said, well, he made me. <laughs> Arrogance. It, it, it's offensive, and you can't really be a good friend if you're arrogant. You can be an artificial friend. Really, arrogant folk are their own best friends. Don't put that on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> right. Then the other extreme is self-pity. Here's the folk who can't get out of their own pain. We all have seasons of pain, but these are folk who are stuck in their feelings for years. They're always the victim. There's always folk that's doing them wrong. And whenever they talk to you, I called up somebody the other day, supposed to be a friend of mine. I talked to him for 30 minutes. Not one time did he ask me how I was doing. Not one time did he ask me how Rhonda was doing. Not one time did he ask me about my children. Not one time did he ask me about my ministry. You see, because it was all about him, him, him. Over a pain that happened four years ago. Right. So whether you're arrogant or self-pity oriented, you end up at the same place. You're self-absorbed. And arrogant people are offensive and self and, and self-pity people are draining. Are you the self-pity person or are you the arrogant person? What's keeping you from putting others first? Secondly, keep your word. You want to have a Jesus-like friendship? You want to be a Jesus-like friend? Keep your word. Tell somebody, keep your word. Keep your word. Keep your word. Keep your word. The people who raised me, they used to say this. Now, of course, Jesus, here's what's going on in the text. Jesus is, is, is prophetically looking forward and saying, I'm going to, Lay down my life for you. And he kept his word. Paul talks about this in uh, the writer of Hebrews, talks about this in verse 5 of chapter 2. He says, look, you ought to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ has. He says, though he was equal to God, he did not, uh, uh, he did not uh, cling uh, to, his, uh, uh, to, to the privileges that he had or take advantages of it. Actually, the next verse says, instead, 
really the Greek is he emptied himself of his divine privileges and he, he became a humble slave and was born a human being and taking the form of a human being he was obedient to God even to, the, even to, to a criminal death on the cross. Now here's the teaching, the point. Jesus humbled himself, emptied himself and when it came to the point of his own crucifixion, he wouldn't break his word. How easy for it for you to break your word to your children, to your colleagues, to your spouse, significant others, your girlfriends, your boyfriends, your siblings. Are you one of those people who are easy to make a promise, I'll be there, I'll do it, you can count on me, and you regularly have to come up with an excuse or an alibi or an explanation for why you didn't, you couldn't, you wouldn't. Keep your word. Or, if you can't keep your word, don't give your word. Just say to people, you know what, I can't make that promise. I'll do the best I can. Tell you a story. Uh, I was in uh, Arkansas and uh, first pastorate and uh, lived in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And Rhonda had f flown out here to see her parents, flew out here to see her parents. And she was scheduled to come back into the airport in Little Rock. And it was my task to pick her up at the airport. And I promised her that I would be there. And so, it was one day, and my car, when the day it came time to pick it up, my car malfunctioned, and so I had to put it in the shop. So I borrowed one of my members' cars. It was a Cadillac. As a matter of fact, it was a low-riding Cadillac. <laughs> now, the young folk don't know nothing about this, but you, you drive down 30, you know, you're a low-ride. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, yeah, come on, come on. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm low riding down the road, man. It's about 90, 95 degrees hot, but it's all right. I got my air conditioning on. That's cool. And then the car overheats about 10 miles before I get to Little Rock. I have to pull it over, it stops. Now, how many of you know, I don't care how nice the car is, how expensive it is, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> so I had to uh, walk 95 degree weather I didn't have a cell phone this was before the days of cell phones and I promised Ron I was going to be there I had no way to let her know I couldn't be there so I'm walking it's 95 degrees the sun is beaming down I don't even have a hat and I'm struggling I'm trying to walk and I try to flag a ride you know get a ride but this is a little rock I'm an African American fellow walking down the street who's going to pick me up <laughs> I'm sweating. I'm looking pretty horrible. And then finally, somebody does pull over and pick me up, takes me almost there. I say almost. almost. Just shy of a mile. Because they weren't going to exit. And I walked the final way there. I, every time I wanted to stop, but when I wanted to stop, I had a picture of Rhonda in my mind being at the gate and my not being there and her being abandoned and left there. And so I pushed and I pushed and I finally got there and I got there just in time, dripping in sweat, half dead. <laughs> but when Rhonda came out of the gate, I was there. I, and she looked at me, the first moment was, wow, the great smile on her face. The next moment was, oh my gosh, what happened to you? <laughs> Come to find out, I think we came this close. She thinks I had maybe a mild sunstroke, and it took me a couple of weeks to recover. But the good news is, I kept my word. And we learn that from Jesus. Surely one who dies on the cross is one who says that wherever you are in life, I'll be there. You can depend on me. I'll keep you on my word. If you're sick, I'll be there. If you're in the valley of life, I'll be there. If you're suffering, I will be there. Jesus is a word-keeping God. He'll keep his word. Number three, open your heart. Everybody say open your heart. No matter how to have a, uh, 
a Jesus-like, how to be a Jesus-like friend. You have to practice. Here's four quick things that you want to do when you open your, eye, your heart. First of all, uh, what, what I mean by that is you begin by prioritizing and investing in relationships. Jesus spent three and a half years with these disciples. Yes, he had a reputation. Yes, he had a ministry. But his number one goal was to pour into and invest in relationships. You know, the, the, the Philippian text says, uh, take interest in others. I know you're at work and you're doing tasks and responsibilities and assignments, but do you know that there are people on the other side of the task and responsibilities and assignments? What happens if you take interest in them, get to know their stories and find out what's going on in their lives and if you discover that somebody is sick or having a hard time, uh, maybe a few days later you send them a text or send them an email and just let them know that I'm praying for you, I'm thinking about you. Take interest in others, invest in relationships. It's revolutionary. You know, it's uh, Tim Keller who says that we often talk about quantity time versus quality time but Tim Keller makes the point really at the end of the day it's a lot of quantity time that facilitates quality moments and you never know when they're going to come you have to invest the time a little bit over a period of time here's the story well, my, me and uh, I went to pick up Lauren I pick up Lauren every Monday Thursday and Friday evening from school that's my days so I'm there so I picked her up the other day. We were walking out, and Lauren was fussing. I said, what's going on? So she's fussing because the teacher took a whole lot of time to review stuff that she already knew, that Lauren already knew. So she was upset. I said, but Lauren, I said, the average kid wants the teacher to review before they take a test. She stops. I mean, we're walking and talking, right? When I say that, she stops. She looks up at me. She said, Daddy, since when, has I, since when have I been average? <laughs> now, that was worth all the tea, y'all, I'm telling you. But it took me a long time to work on that record. I started when she was about six years old. I started, I started uh, 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 challenging her. I said, look, girl, you're going to grow up and be the president of the United States? We're going to argue about it. You're going to be president of the United States? I don't want to be president of the United States. How come? No, no, no. I want to. Come on, be president so I can fly in the Air Force One. No, I don't want to be president of the United States. All right. But you, but, but you know you can be. She says, yes, I know I can be. Okay, great. You're going to be a preacher? No, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to be a preacher. But you know, all right, my point is I'm trying to nurture and hear this notion of self-esteem and image that the that sky has no limits for her, that in Christ she can do and be anything, right? So I'm picking her up Monday and Thursday and Friday, week after week, but somehow over a period of time, come on now, I can't control it. I just gotta be there. And there it comes. Daddy, since when have I been ever? That's a quality moment. You have to invest in relationships. And then you have to not only invest, but you have to be generous with resources, of time, with your time and your resources. I just gave you an example of time. Let me give you a quick example of resources. Ron and I, we were about to uh, purchase a house. We were in a community. Violence had risen. My son had been threatened several times. And we found the house, and we needed uh, a huge down payment, over $100,000. I got a call from a friend. I'm going to change his name because this is public. So I got a call from a friend. I'll call him Bill. Right in the nick of time, he called. And he said, what's going on? I told him what was happening, blah, blah, blah. He said, well, well what's the down payment? I said, it's 100000 plus, blah, blah. He said, well, this, is this the... House that you think? I said, yeah. He said, don't worry about it. He said, when you get ready to sign the papers, call me, and I'll transfer $100,000 into your account. Can somebody say friend? Yeah. And so a week later, when I got ready, I called him. No notary public, no lawyer, no papers being filled out. He simply transferred $100,000 into my account. Can you say friend? friend? Now somebody's thinking, I wish I had a friend like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> All right, now here's a, here's a catch. Here's a catch. Watch it. Now, if he ever needed, if he ever got into big financial need, he couldn't come to me and get $100,000 transferred into his account. Because I, I just don't have those resources, right? But a little while later, he ran into a major crisis. And the person he knew he could call was me. At 12 midnight, I was on the phone with him, 12, 1, 2, 3. And we did it repeatedly until we helped him work through what crisis he was going through. You see, now you see the point here? It's not tit for tat. It's not you give me money and I give you money. No, no, no. It's really an exchange of hearts, right? You give me your heart. You give me what you have and I give you what I have. You see the point? And it's about a generosity. It's about a generosity. Now, let me make the point even broader. Listen, uh, he's white. I'm, 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 I'm African American. I'm black, right? He's wealthy. I'm something less than wealthy, all right? <laughs> he's of one political party. I'm of another political party. He stayed in the suburbs. I stayed in the inner city. And yet, covered by the blood of Jesus in the body of Christ, we found one another, built a friendship. All right, here is the point. A Jesus-like friend moves beyond your boundaries. It's not enough just to know folk like you, your race, your neighborhood, your class, your politics, your theology. Come on, get beyond all of that. And when you come in a church like this, Jesus says, learn to lay down your life, your stuff. Get to know other folk and it will enrich who you are. Tell somebody, I think he's making sense. Tell him. <laughs> Jesus like friendship is about generosity. But then there's a transparency built into it. South transparency. Uh, it, it, it's about, uh, I think it's David Thoreau who says, and my mother in law quotes it all the time, that, that, uh, that men have quiet desperation. And, and, and what they really mean by that, by that quote is simply this, that some of us, we say we have friends and we talk to them on the phone, we're texting all the time, we're Facebooking all the time, and we're this close from a divorce and we've never said anything about it. We're texting and we're talking and we're going to coffee, we're hanging out at Starbucks together, we're just laughing it up, and we're this close from falling into some horrendous, horrible, terrible sin of mistake or lifestyle, and we've not said anything about it. Or we've already fallen, our life is in a mess, and we really do need some help, but we won't talk about it. Or we're sick, or somebody that we love is, has cancer, but we keep it to ourselves. You cheat yourself out of the love, out of the help, out of the prayers, out of the support that God has already provided for you to have because you can't be transparent. You hear what Jesus says? Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves a servant. Uh, and I'll tell you why. He says, because a master uh, does not confide in his servants, but I have disclosed to you everything the Father has told me. And the way that you develop relationships with people that you can tell everything to is that you become a person that folk can tell everything to. You become a safe person. You practice it. You keep stuff. You don't, you don't judge them when you try to bless them. All right, let me see the last point here. Uh, and then you practice forgiveness and grace. Shout forgiveness and grace. I married a couple on Good Friday recently, and I told them, I said, now I'm marrying you on Good Friday. It's a Good Friday evening. I said, it's a really good time to get married. I said, because when you run into a crisis, you know, Good Friday, that's when Jesus crucified. I said, so when you run into a crisis, remember you got married on Good Friday. In other words, uh, when you can't forgive, remember that Jesus shed his blood so he could forgive you. And if he can do it for you, you can do it for your spouse. If you want to learn how to practice forgiveness, be honest about all that God has got to forgive you for. 
And in grace, shout grace. grace. Unmerited favor. That means give favor not because they earn it, not because they do it, but because God has been that good to you. All right, here's my last point. We finish. Uh, uh, and then the last thing you got to learn how to do is to speak truth in love. Come on, shout truth in love. Now, the church hasn't always been good about this, right? Because oftentimes we've spoken truth, but it's been disconnected from relationship. It's been disconnected from a sense of love. We just shout it out. We just shout out all the things that we're opposed and against. But, 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 but when you speak truth disconnected from relationship, from love, it comes across as harsh criticism. It comes across as judgment. But when you speak truth, that is connected to relationship and the person knows you love them, it ought to then come across as helpful insight and healthy counsel. So here's where I wrap it up. Give you a great example. I have a vest team and you don't know what that is, but these are guys that help to make sure they staff me to make sure I don't forget and I keep my sanity from back there to here. And, and, and so... Rhonda has helped to prepare them to work with me. She said, now listen, y'all don't know my husband. She said, you, when he come out of the bathroom, you, you stop him and look him up and down. She said, because he's just liable to come out with a shirt tail all out. And she said, and if you're not careful, he'll come out, his, 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 his zipper's down. You watch him. So she's trained him well. And so... Uh, <laughs> So I came out the other day, man, I thought I was looking good, man, I was all stepping in, my cologne was on everything, and, and, and Chris stopped me. He said, Pastor. I said, what? He said, your zipper's down. I looked down and my zipper was down. I was so grateful that he spoke truth <laughs> in love. Right? Listen, here's some of y'all. Some of y'all, you're like this, you're so sensitive to advice and counsel you, you, you're so sensitive that what you would rather is to come out and you'd rather for your quote unquote friend, you say, how do I look? And they see your zippers down, but you don't want them to tell them your zippers down. You want them to say, oh, you look good. And then, and then you'll come right on out here, get up here on the stage and be preaching and preaching and you don't hear a word I say because you're looking at my zipper down. <laughs> A Jesus-like friendship says that if I'm going to be a friend of yours, I'm not going to let you walk out with your zipper down. Come on now. I need friends who can tell me the zipper of your life is down. The zipper of your logic is down. Does that make sense? Let me end it here. If you do all of that, there's only four things I told you to do. Four things. Put others first. Keep your word. Open your heart. Speak truth in love. If you do all of that, there's still going to be a gap. And the gap is going to be is because you're going to be practicing a Jesus-like love with broken people. But before you get too arrogant about it, whoever's practicing a Jesus-like love with you is going to be doing it with a broken person. So what's going to help you to get to bridge that gap is... That the first person you practice a Jesus-like love with is Jesus. Jesus, because he has already put you first. He always keeps his word. His heart is always open to you. He brings grace and forgiveness and he invests resources and time and he invites you to come into a deep place with all of your brokenness and your mistakes and all of that stuff. He says, I'll wrestle with you and I'll speak truth out of love to you. And it's only out of that place 
of interacting with Jesus. Even if you don't believe that Jesus is all that he says that he is. Even if you don't believe that he's fully deity. Listen, just, 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 just look him up anyway. Come on now. And just, 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 just read about him in the New Testament and practice what he's done. And say, say Jesus, I want to get to know you. If you're anywhere on the line, I want to get to know you. And, and, and I promise you, as you go deeper in Jesus and allow Jesus to get deeper in you, then you will be able to practice a Jesus-like friendship and it will change your life. Give God a hand, praise you. All right, let me ask you. Here's your homework. Let me see your connection card. Let me see your connection card. All right. So where it says response to the sermon, here's what I want you to do. Some of you don't know how well you're practicing these steps. You think you put others first. You're not sure, but you think you keep your word, etc. So here's the first thing. I want you to identify about three or four people in your life who knows you very, very well. And over the course of this week, I want you to go to them and ask them how they think you're doing in these four areas. And give them permission. Tell them, I'm not going to stop talking to you or beat you up. I need the truth. Because I really do want to grow. See, you can hear all you want, but it's only until you do that you grow. He said, really, tell me, this. tell me how I'm doing. And then take where they tell you, put those markers down, and then I want you to start working every week on practicing these four basic points. And if you will do that, just simply write, I will follow Jesus. Everybody shout amen. Turn this card in so we can follow it with you. God bless you.